to go over some, uh, I guess, some open remarks, housekeeping rules, and then uh, we'll turn this over to Mick and uh, we can get on with uh, all the, the workshops. Um, one of the reasons we are here, as many of you know, at the NTRA, we used to have the um, Safety and Integrity Alliance. As a matter of fact, Steve Cook, somewhere in here, keep, uh, Steve was heavily involved. And I know he connected with Mick on a lot of things. And we are now here today because it looks like the Safety and Integrity Alliance will probably roll into HISA. And uh, although HISA is not put together yet until now we're sitting here in like the 2023, um, we're obligated to do this for you horsemen. We, you know, the main thing here, we talk about the safe, safe surfaces. We want to make sure we take care of our equine athletes, and we also want to take care of uh, the human athletes. So Mick has put together an outstanding uh, lineup of experts to share that knowledge with you today. And uh, lastly, uh, one of the things that we want to make sure you do here, and we'll take the time to introduce everybody so you guys can all connect, but the networking here is um, really a good idea here, and there are no dumb questions. And you raise your hand anytime you want to ask questions. Uh, these experts are here to uh, answer your questions. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Mick and uh, he'll get the program rolling. Thank you. <clears throat> We've got a combined virtual and in-person session to begin with. And this first session, we're talking about is uh, looking at the effect of HISA on the tracks, large and small. And this is kind of uh, more timely than I would have even imagined we would have had at this point, given the fact that just last Friday, the Federal Trade Commission approved the HISA safety regulations. So what that means is what were the draft regulations are now uh, moving forward. And what I think this really means is the people who've worked so hard, uh, Dr. Sue Stover in the back row there and Glenn Kozak, who's going to be uh, connecting remote, who are both on the safety committee. What this really means is their problems are just now beginning. It's only going to get worse. So um, if you, you'll need to. Oh, okay. So is, and so um, what we're going to start out with today is Glenn Kozak from uh, New York Racing Association is on here. Jim Pendergast from Keeneland is on remote. And Dennis Moore is sitting in the front row here. Dennis takes care of Santa Anita, uh, Santa Anita, Los Alamitas, and Del Mar racetracks. What we're going to start out with is Jim Pendergast led a committee for the Safety and Integrity Alliance to develop a new series of surface code standards. Jim led this committee that also had Dennis as well as Glenn on it. That then began as the basis for the HISA regulations related to surfaces. So I will let Jim, who I think the sound was working okay and they can work on the video. I will, I will let Jim come in and talk a little bit about the process for the Safety and Integrity Alliance Surfaces effort. Thank you, so Thank you Mick. Um, our committee was formed in October of 2019 uh, to develop standards for the coalition. And was on it. Mick Peterson was on the committee and Matt Juliano was on the committee. Hank Zeitlin was a coordinator for us and he kept us on track and and tried to get us to finish in time, which took uh, about four months. We had quite a few meetings, and in between the meetings, we were selecting documents that, that were already in existence, like the NTRA's safety document, uh, the, the ARCI's model rules. We used the New York Task Force document, British Horse Racing Authority, and then several other state um, documents that, that had uh, regulations and standards for racing surfaces. And so we used all that and we reviewed it and we tried to pick out the pertinent points as we went through those, those months of uh, trying to create the standards. And what we wound up focusing on was record keeping through the MQS, um, pre-race meat testing and uh, inspection of the racetracks and then uh, design documentation of all the racetracks. So we incorporated all of that uh, into our document, which wound up being 
a 10 page document. Uh, we broke it down into specific areas of, of dirt, turf and synthetic. And, and we keyed on all of the different things that we saw as a group and that other people saw as being important to maintaining the safety of those, of those surfaces. And then ultimately we presented that to the Thoroughbred Safety Coalition in January. And I believe they adopted those standards in March of, of 2020. And I think uh, a fair amount of what we came up with during that period of time has been incorporated into HISIS documents. We're gonna get a little smoother as we go through this. Uh, so trust me, this is, stick with it. My goal on this is to be as good as what we're expecting every fourth grade teacher in America to do, to switch back and forth remote and local. So I'm gonna let uh, Glenn Kozak talk a little bit about how this influenced the surfaces work that was done by the HISA Safety Committee. Glenn? Yeah, thank you, Mick. And uh, just to, to start, as you started off the conversation, um, just have to make sure that the credit for all the work that went forward with this HISA um, proposal Sue Stover shepherded this project uh, and was incredible on keeping things organized and keeping the committee members on task to, uh, you know, to get the proper information, to take industry feedback, practical application, so it's something that can be implemented at all the surface, at all the tracks, you know, big and small. And I think that's probably one of the most critical points because Jim touched on everything. The NTRA set up the the framework or the, the baseline to build off of. So we had a great document, great format to work off of, and now putting something that's practical that can be done by smaller tracks, be able to capture this information electronically for historical use. Um, you know, and again, the, the ultimate goal was to tie this back into safety for, for horse and rider. So to be able to know what's been to a, done to a track over, you know, months or seasons or years of operation um, is invaluable. So as Jim pointed out, whether it was the Mid-Atlantic um, Coalition with getting some information from that, the New York Task Force report that was done back in 2012, you know, we, we picked and pulled, um, you know, practical applications from all these areas. And, um, you know, and, and I know with the responses that came back to the FTC and even just to our committee, um, you know, the smaller tracks and not even just smaller tracks, but some of the tracks were asking the reasoning behind it. And I think, um, you know, with what a seminar like this is able to bring, as was pointed out again earlier, the networking and the communication is invaluable to, to be able to see what another track is doing or to set up just the basics. And I mean, and hopefully that's what HISA brings to this is that this is just the start of what's to come in the industry and to be able to build on it for safer surfaces that are better for the horses, better for the riders, and easier to maintain and, and allow these superintendents the ability to know why things are reacting the way they are in different regions and geographically. And I think it's great that you've got Dennis and Jim on this because each one of us is dealing with a different region, what we have to worry about, the time of the year that we're operating and even the surfaces that we're, we're maintaining. And I think that, that also went into HISA's, um, you know, when the rules were established that, you know, there's no cookie cutter way to do this that captures every surface throughout the United States. So looking at this, you know, we captured the major components, whether it's something as simple as, you know, measuring the surface. And, uh, you know, we got some pushback on that. And I, I just, I was shocked because if somebody's gonna take the time to grade the track, that they can't go out and measure the track in multiple points, and even jot it down on a piece of paper until it's done electronically. I mean, th these are the basics, you know? So again, I think it's part of getting that framework established. And we went through it here in New York with going from paper to electronic and we capture everything with the MQS. And uh, I mean, I, I can't, you know, I know you're gonna get into that a little bit later in the program, but as an invaluable, um, you know, component to our operation here with all the surfaces that we have, all the different supervisors that are working, all the different pieces of equipment, 
Um, I mean, there's times where there's difference between what equipment we use at Aqueduct and what we use at Belmont because one is training and one is racing. And I think having that electronic data to go back and look at, you know, how the track reacted, what took place, you know, um, fortunately, uh, you know, working with HISA and what is going to be able to be done with electronic files as, as that evolves it's only gonna make communication among the tracks even better. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, looking at the industry, the, the closer we can keep these surfaces to one another, as far as composition and consistency, the better off, you know, the equine athletes are, because I mean, these horses are traveling, shipping from track to track, you know, to get accustomed to a different track. Um, you know, it, it takes some of that um, for, as far as a trainer or an owner, take some of that variability out of it. But again, this is something that's all evolving as this data and science comes out of it. And I think, uh, you know, to, to work with what's been done through the NTRA as the framework, and then to piggyback off of that with what Racing Surface Testing Laboratory has been able to do with providing that information for um, the, the track managers ha has been, fantastic and again all that testing all that data gets put into the mqs so you know we're capturing so much on there from you know e even with the uh jockeys if there's a jockey injury or an exercise rider it's all documented on the tablet so we're able to go back and you know when we do a review of an incident having that information and having it not going through security, not going through the safety stewards, not going through the stewards, but starting at that base level of the track operators or the track supervisors um, has been very, very helpful with our application. And, you know, I think there's certainly so many variabilities between track to track and seasons that they operate. You know, as I said earlier, this is just the basic framework to get started with and, uh, I can't stress enough the work that Sue put into this and Ann McGovern to get this to where we're at today to help move the industry forward with, you know, a, a framework that works for everybody. And I think that's one of the, the key points to what was done here. It wasn't handling the bigger tracks. It wasn't not thinking about the smaller tracks, but the whole focus was going to be what was going to help, you know, the horse and rider. Thank you so much, uh, Gwen. Um, I'll put Jim on the spot a little bit here. Uh, one of the things that Jim has is not only does he, he, is, does he oversee Keeneland surfaces with Alfredo back in the back row, but he also takes care of the Thoroughbred Center. And that's a very different uh, 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 reality as far as resources and timing and that. So, Jim, uh, uh, well, I know this is really, HISA is more of a broad overview how has Keeneland's maintenance and oversight affected how you do uh, the Thoroughbred Center? And I'm gonna then give it to Dennis because taking care of Los Alamitas as well as Del Mar and Santa Anita, he's had to, he's had to straddle these same sorts of issues, which I, should, I think are one of the big challenges we're facing. Well, with Keeneland, you know, we're, we're racing and training at, at the same time and at the Thoroughbred Center, it's just training. So I've, I've, seeing some differences there in how we're able to deal with the tracks. Um, you know, we have all afternoon at the Thoroughbred Center to take care of those tracks. And so, uh, you know, there's some adjustments when you're trying to race and trying to take care of the, of the uh, track at the same time. So we get a lot more, a lot more chance to maintain the training track than we do uh, necessarily at Keeneland in the afternoon. Uh, the surfaces are very similar, but we see some differences just in the weather. Uh, even though we're in the same same city, we're on different sides of the town. So we'll see differences in the weather. We can see temperature changes and the, the wind makes a difference in how much water you have to put on the surface. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we have to do at Keeneland where we're watering all day during the race meet, we don't have to water at night. At the Thorbert Center, we try to water at night to, to maintain the moisture and keep, uh, keep from evaporating it. And then, um, you know, we're able to grade in the afternoons at, at uh, the Thoroughbred Center, and it's a little more limited during the race day to be able to grade the track at Keeneland. So sometimes we're grading at night there. Sometimes, uh, you know, we're just grading on, on the off day. So those are some of the differences we see, even though we have uh, very similar 
type of surface as far as the, the composition. Okay, I'm going to try this and see if Dennis, if we get feedback. I think he's okay. I'm, okay, I'm here. Well, you know, we've got unique situations at La Salle and, and Del Mar and Santa Anita. And, uh, of course, everybody thinks it never rains in California, but it actually does, but just not that often. And we'll see a big difference between the three tracks. La Salle not only runs thoroughbreds, but they also run quarter horses. And with the track has a little more silt and clay that gives it more binding for the uh, quarter horses. And then when we go over there for the straight thoroughbred meet, we have to work the cushion in a different way and the pad a different way to get it to where we're running like we are with Del Mar and, and San Anita. And so all the maintenance is done the same. Now, I think the protocols that we started putting in place in uh, 219 has, has made a huge, huge difference in, in what we see as far as breakdowns and fatalities. Um, we, in 2020, after the disaster of 2019, we had zero fatalities. Now, I'd like to sit here and tell you that's all because I'm really great and I did all that, but that's, that was just a small part of it. The protocols is what have really made a difference. It, it's made horsemen have become more attentive to what they're doing. Uh, we're more watching what we're doing and, and, you know, recording everything on a daily basis and giving it to, uh, to Mick to keep for us and so we can analyze and, and what have you. I probably, I think Mick has told me this, okay, do more testing than anybody. Our material in California that we use, our sands, is more of a manufactured sand. So we, they break down much faster. So we have to figure out how much material we need to sand, we need to put back in the track to bring it back to where it should be and keep it there. And we did this at Santa Anita as well, and it's worked out really, really well for us. So uh, I think we're all in the same path and that this is long overdue. Uh, and I think the horsemen in California, you know, they were not too fond of all this happening in the beginning, but they've done a fabulous job of, of getting around and following the, the protocols, even though it's been an inconvenience for them. Uh, they've seen the, the end result. And the end result is that we have to be safer. And, you know, for the jockey's life and for the horse's life. And uh, I think we're proving that, that we're, we, we're doing that through all these protocols and and uh, differences we've made in the services and what Glenn and, and Jim and, and Mick I did, we knew that one, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, there's a lot of difference between California and Kentucky and New York and vice versa. So we kind of took that into and, and put that down into the application of where we need to be and how we need to get there. And, and uh, you know, the, the great work that, that Sue has done, and I've known Sue for since she started doing this in California. Uh, like I said, I'm old, but uh, I started out in 1972 in this business and uh, I love it. And I just think that uh, I wish we would have done this 30, 30 years ago and we'd be a lot better off than what we are today, but we're gonna get there. You didn't think I'd talk that long, did you? I surprised you. No, you got plenty of time. <laughs> uh Glenn, if you don't mind, would you mind stepping through, if you, I'll put you on the spot now, uh, a little bit, what the measurements are that are done on a daily basis. Keep in mind that there's a number of, of people in the audience here who are not associated with thoroughbred racing. They're in the rest of the equine world. And some of this, as we go further along, we've got several people talking about uh, arena surfaces. And so making sure we cross, cross pollinate those ideas is really important. Sure. So again, depending on the training or the racing track that we're at, um, training, we'll do moisture measurements uh, before training. And then after training, we'll also do moisture measurements and we'll also go through and do cushion depth um, measurements. And meaning we'll use the TDR probe that'll do our um, volumetric motor, moisture content that we'll go through. And again, with what HISA proposed and with what the practical application, we do it at every marker pole. And then uh, depending on racing or training, we'll do it at every eighth pole for training. But again, it's the time that it takes to go through measuring four spots on the track, 
it takes about 12, 10 seconds to do each location. So it, it's not a heavy lift to go through and grab that moisture measurement. Um, the instrument that's used is then taken, it just data logs that moisture information, then um, go back and that's where tied to the MQS system that it downloads and you're able to get the reports on any of that moisture content. What we'll do as well is another individual and what we have it is assigned to somebody that actually measures the track. So not only is the grader operator measuring the track on what he's grading, but there's somebody that measures the track prior to grading and also after grading. So that way, you know, the grader operators have an idea where they are with, you know, different times of the year, the application changes because if we've got a, uh, you know, 12 degree night and the track was wet the day before, we'll have five or seven tractors out there harrowing all night and there'll be two extra inches of material on the inside. So, um, you know, again, we capture all that information with the measurements um, where we could grade the track three times before racing um, over at Aqueduct. And, and that's one of the benefits of, uh, you know, as Jim pointed out earlier with the training center, your maintenance schedule can be doctored or, you know, programmed around it. So we have the luxury of grading at five o'clock in the morning where we wouldn't have that luxury with training going on, then grade again at nine o'clock and, brush it up at 11 o'clock right before racing. So having that flexibility and having the equipment obviously makes, uh, makes our job and maintaining the tracks much easier. But again, it's capturing that information, as I said, because now you've got an idea of what material is moving and what stages with what transitions you're going through with the weather. Um, you know, a drier track that uh, is just cold, it's cold. And you know, like you said, once a track is freeze dried, it doesn't get any more freeze dried. So, you know, the tractors don't have to go around and beat the track up at night and go around, you know, constantly. And I think that's one of the, the important things is the educational component of this is, you know, getting the trainers up to speed on what your process is and why you're doing it. Because when, when I started in New York, and say, well, why are the tractors sitting for half an hour or 45 minutes? And, and just say, you know, we're not wasting diesel fuel and we're not wasting steel on the harrow pins because the track's already set. It's frozen. It's, it's freeze dried. It's not, nothing's tacked to the bottom of the track. It's not going to freeze anymore. And now you just have to spin the tractors around and turn the, the cushion over. So again, all that stuff is captured though, Mick, where we're going through and how fast the tractors are going, the type of implements that are using, where we've got four different types of harrows that we use depending on the condition in the winter time. Um, you know, the direction of the harrows, which way they're going. Um, so we, we capture all that and not only for the reports that go into the MQS, but also we provide the depth charts after grading to, um, you know, the betting public. So they're able to see what the track is actually graded at. Um, you know, and again, I think that will continue to evolve as the technology advances with providing moisture content, you know, for both dirt and turf to be able to do that. We do um, provide that with the turf. We'll, uh, you know, document when the courses have been cut, um, you know, how much irrigation, any maintenance that's done even to the turf courses to be able to, uh, you know, provide the customers the most accurate and up-to-date information. Um, so again, we capture a lot even for training on the surfaces. When any maintenance is done on the surfaces, whether it's adding silt, adding clay, adding salt, um, you know, the grading that's done, um, that, that's all documented and, and logged in the MQS. Um, the, the maintenance that we do on the turf, it's a, a similar situation where we will use a penetrometer, we've got a going stick, we've got the TDR, um, you know, so again, each one of them has a, um, let's say, a, a component that is more reliable, um, and I think it's, you know, some of it is operator dependent, so I think uh, as some of this, this instrumentation becomes more available, and I know, uh, you know, Mick, you're working on some of those things. 
I think that will certainly help because I think on some of it, not I think I know, you can manipulate the number. So unless you have the same operator on a piece of equipment all the time, measuring either, uh, you know, on a going stick, you can, you can manipulate the numbers unless it's the same person, the same force using it. Um, so I think if you can take that component out of it, it will certainly help. Um, and I think that, that basically, kind of, even mowing, mowing height, mowing direction, when we vacuum the tracks, we, we try and put as much of the maintenance that goes on. Um, you know, we had the other day, we had the blankets down at Aqueduct. We cover the turf courses, both turf courses in here at Belmont. But to be able to go year over year and look at the weather and the trends on how that has helped, you know, not only is it helping, you know, to protect the grass from the geese that, you know, destroy it up here where we can't shoot them or do anything with it. But it also, you know, just moves the process along when the temperature does start to rise. And uh, so you can correlate the, the blankets to the temperatures to see where your growth is in the springtime and to see how a track rebounds from, you know, aqueduct will race on it very late into the fall, usually the first week in December. So there's, there's basically no growth going in at that point. So you were doing our maintenance, documenting everything that's done with the verta draining, with the top dressing, with the overseeding, um, you know, a dormant fertilization, a dormant seeding, and then, you know, the blankets go on. But again, now we've got that information that you can pull up the last six years on what we've done where, you know, it was, used to be flipping through a three ring binder to try and find out where, uh, what you did and where the numbers are at, where now it's just a, you know, a click on a mouse to be able to get the information that you need. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I, I like, uh, just given the fact that we were, we we're in the process of scheduling this right now for Keeneland, uh, Jim, and then Alfredo is welcome to chime in and, uh, and, and tell Jim when he's, when he's wrong. Uh, we're scheduling the pre-meet pre -meet inspection. What does that involve? And what does that information do? What, what do you find useful out of that information? Well, really all of it is useful for us, but what it involves is uh, the, the uh, biomechanical hoof tester going around the track, testing at uh, every pole for us to tell us if we have consistency in the compaction of the surface, and then the ground penetrating radar to tell us if we have any issues with the base, and it also gives us an idea of, of where our cushion level is, how, how deep the cushion is. And then we get samples taken at each quarter pole for uh, composition. And that, that helps us just as much as anything because it tells us if we have a little more silt and clay in one place and a little less sand, uh, and it helps us get the track consistent. So uh, as, as you told us and, and Alfredo knows, uh, sometimes we have to reverse the direction of the grading and try to pull material from, from uh, one pole to another to keep everything uh, consistent as we go around. And, and what we do is we're trying to get ready for the race meet and, and you, the testing that you do, we typically will have at least two weeks before the race meet, sometimes three, depending on uh, what the date is and what the weather looks like. And uh, so we will try to prepare the track just as if we were gonna have racing before you come do the testing so that we know what we're gonna see when, when our, our first race day gets there. So we'll go out with the Harrows and we'll work the track as if we were, as if we were during a race day prior to when Caleb comes to do the testing. And then we look for, you know, the, the good weather days so we can see what it's going to look like on um, a normal race day and give you the best chance to get good results for us from uh, what we see with the surface. All right, I'll give you a chance if you've got anything to add to what Jim said. <laughs> No, actually not. But he's he's um, he's right in uh, the directions that we the we grade. Sometimes we just grade the the way we like it. And now what we're doing is grading every direction, so the material moves evenly from the back, from the front, and in on each turn that equals the the, the composition. And when we take all the uh, testing, that will that will answer our 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 hard work doing a different patterns on the track. Yeah, and that's one of the things is, I mean, it can sometimes help inform the daily maintenance by seeing what needs to be um, modified at that point. 
Dennis? Well, and, and Nick, if I can have one more minute on that. Um, as, as Glenn was saying, we keep the records on, on the history of this. And so we can look back at the testing that's been done and see how this year's testing compares to the last race meter, the previous race meter, what it was in 2015. And that helps us a lot to make sure that, that we have the right amount of cushion and we can look at our successful race meets and we try to replicate those. Whatever the results that we saw during the successful meets, we want to try to repeat that and have the track as close to that as possible. So having the historical data in the MQS and with uh, the results of your testing really helped us a lot. Yeah, I think the one thing we, we can all take from this is that consistency is, is a key that we're looking forward to. Uh, that not only helps us out, but it also helps the horsemen out and, and keeps the track safer. And all these things combined together, the testing we do, the soil testing, the compaction, um, we've, we've done some of this stuff for years, but never to where we have the capability of, of going for, forward and, and farther with it. And, and that's what Mick and uh, MQS uh, brings to us is that we've got all this data at our fingertips and, you know, it rained two eight inches today. What did we do the last time we rained that amount? How the crack track come out from it? Each step of that is documented uh, through, through the MQS. And one thing I wanted to talk about was in 2019, uh, when I came back and, and that when Santa Anita was, was having their, their problems, the one thing that we did right away, Kayla was out there and we test every step that we did. You know, we, we tested the track when it was sealed. We tested it after we opened it with the float heralds and the rakes. Uh, we, we tested it after we tilled it. We, we tested it. The, so all that data we're actually using still today that we gathered there to see how we came out of that and, and brought the, brought the track back. So, uh, you know, we, we, more than anything, I think that's what we have to do is, is stay consistent and, and uniform and, and everybody's in this together and we just keep moving forward. I'm going to open this up if there's some additional questions. I mean, there's been a, there's, there's a lot of changes happening in racing right now, and we've got uh, uh, a number of people here right now who were instrumental in that. I, I think we'll, we'll even open it up to asking Dr. Stover a question <laughs> since she, 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 she led the whole effort. So does, uh, do, do we have any questions from the audience? Oh, okay. So uh, Steve said, Steve talked about the MQS, the algorithm. So the maintenance quality system or the MQS is a three-stage process. It's first to set up an, and characterizing the equipment at the track. The second stage of the maintenance quality system is a pre-meet inspection. So prior to racing each race meet, that's a complicated process for some race racetracks that run essentially year round. So if you're running year round in a racetrack, that would mean you'd do it twice a year before the seasons change, you know, before you get into winter uh, track surfaces and before you'd get into summer track surfaces. The third step of that is what uh, Glenn was talking about is the daily measurements. And the daily measurements are probably the most difficult and, uh, and time consuming part of the whole thing. Having somebody come out and say a perfect track on a perfect day when you're prepared for it, know it's coming is, you know, that's preparing for the test. That's the pre-meet inspection. But the daily monitoring is an ongoing challenge, identifying which measurements are critical to be made and making sure that you're not asking the racetracks to make measurements of things that don't matter. So we eventually, we need to build this. And that's why HISA is so important, particularly on that, is this is the opportunity to look all across racing and begin to see which one of these measurements are important. Right. Are all the tracks the, the people on no. sorry? Um, are all the tracks using the same software? I mean, I know they're all using the same testing, but are, is the MQS going to be one software system that everybody's using? So right now there are 14 racetracks that use the MQS on a on a consistent basis. There's another five of them that participate in a partial basis, not to the level of what Keeneland or Santa Anita. Or, uh, or, or, or Naira does. Um, what's happening uh, is right now, the Jockey Club 
information systems is, is rewriting the software and it's being tailored better for the smaller tracks. That software will be available to the smaller tracks. Uh, uh, and, and this is obviously a challenge. It's got a lot more manual entry because automation may be a priority in New York, but if you've got a smaller racetrack, the financial cost is important. So anything else you'd like to add, Jim or Glenn? Yeah, Glenn, Glenn touched a little bit on uh, the HISA committee and them thinking about the smaller tracks as well as the large tracks when they were when they were putting the standards together. And I think that's really important. We thought about it with our committee too, that you know, some of the things that we're able to do at Keeneland, that Glenn's able to do in New York, that Dennis can do at Santa Anita or Del Mar, not everybody's going to be able to do. And I think it's imperative that that these tracks, the bigger tracks, support the research. And then that we share that with all of the smaller tracks that may not necessarily be able to afford it. So I think for our industry and for the safety of the horses and the riders throughout the country, we have to keep that in the forefront uh, to, to support the, the research and, and keep moving forward with this. Thanks, Jim. Glenn, anything else that you'd like to add? No, just uh, thank you for putting this together, Mick, and for all the work you do with for the industry. Thanks. Well, I think our next step here in our schedule today is the uh, is the break. Uh, Dene, anything else? All right. So we're, we'll have a short break again, and then we'll come back and we'll be listening to Turf in the Transition Zone. So we'll have a quite a shift. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Dennis.